done in collaboration with uh, Yvon Castin at uh, Laboratoire Castel Bruxelles in, in Paris. And so uh, the system we have considered is uh, an ideal Fermi gas, which is perturbed by the presence of a single impurity. So uh, in the ideal Fermi gas, uh, the particles has a ma have a mass m, and kf is the Fermi wave number. So this system is perturbed by uh, this impurity with mass capital N, and eventually the impurity can move with a, a wave vector capital K. So uh, since we are at zero temperature, there is no interaction between the fermions, but uh, there is uh, an S-wave interaction between the fermions and the impurity, which can be described by two parameters. So these two parameters are the scattering length and uh, the flashback length. So this flashback length is related to uh, the range of the interaction. So now we know that uh, by applying a magnetic field, one can change the value and the sign of the scattering length. So it's, uh, it can be uh, a tool to change uh, the interactions. Uh, yes, actually, you have um, in the scattering amplitude f of okay. Uh, I actually don't know about uh, the scattering phase shift, but I know how how to derive it from the scattering amplitude if you want. So uh, what you have, you have uh, one over a plus you have i k, and then here usually you have minus one half. Uh, k square r uh, zero. We called it yesterday. So I'm well here. Instead of having this, I have plus uh, k square r star. So the link is that r star is minus two times r zero. Okay. So so r star is always positive. Well, in the literature, you find it like this. Yes. OK, so let me remind you what happens when we apply a magnetic field to the scattering length. So we can describe the scattering process between uh, the impurity and the fermion at a distance x between each other using a, a two-channel model. So here uh, you have the open channel, and the dashed line is the closed channel. So whenever you have a molecular bound state in the closed channel, this can change the scattering properties. And by applying a magnetic field, you can change the position of this molecular state with respect to 0. So in this way, you can change the value of the scattering length. Uh, where are minus one half? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I, I two I times, yeah, 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 two I times. Well, uh, the open channel means that imagine that the, the two particles arrive with this energy. Okay. So this channel is open because they, they come from this channel, right? Yeah, no, no, no. This, this channel is the, okay. the, in, the interaction, interaction potential, potential that they see each other. Channel. So imagine that the, the, the incoming energy is here. Okay. So this channel is prohibited because it's too high in energy. So when they're coming here, there is a, there is a coupling between the uh, open channel and the closed channel. Okay. And you can, uh, they can switch. yes, they can go to the uh, molecular state and, and for feedback. yes, right. for some time, and then go back. Okay. But uh, what, what, what's important for me is that in this way, just by changing this position, I can change the scattering length. So, and this is what I, I, I'm plotting here. So uh, this is how the scattering length changes with the magnetic field. 
So you see that there is uh, a magnetic field B0 for which we have a divergence of the scattering length. And delta B is um, the, uh, uh, the resonance width, which means that is the region in which one can change the scattering length significantly. Outside of this region, the scattering length is not changed. So it turns out that to the resonance width, there is uh, related a length, which is called R star, and which, which is proportional to 1 over delta B. So if delta B is very large, we talk about a wide resonance, and so R star will be practically negligible. While when delta B is very, very narrow, we talk about a narrow resonance, and R star will be an important parameter. It, it will be large. So uh, you see now that there are these two lengths. So there is the scattering length and R star that uh, compete uh, with each other to, to determine the ground state of the system. And this is what is interesting for us. So we want to calculate the ground state of the system depending on these two lengths. So experimentally, uh, narrow fetchback resonances are important because it turns out that in these mixtures, fermionic mixtures, potassium-40 and lithium-6, there exist only narrow fetchback resonances. And so to give you a number, R star in these mixtures uh, reaches up to, well, higher than 100 nanometers, which compared to the, st the standard van der Waal lengths, which is 2 nanometers, is a lot uh, larger. So we expect that in these mixtures there will be uh, a lot of physics coming from this R star. So the ground state of one impurity in a Fermi C is known to present two quasi-particle branches. So if I plot uh, on a horizontal axis the strength of the interaction, 1 over KFA, there exists a critical value on the left of which the ground state is polaronic, and on the right the ground state is dimeronic. What does it mean? It means that on the left-hand side, the impurity interacts with the fermions, so changes the density around itself. And so this change of density can be described as a quasi-particle, which is called the polaron. On the right-hand side, we have a similar phenomenon, but now the impurity prefers to take uh, one fermion in the Fermi C, make a two-body bound state, and then is this two-body bound state that changes the density around itself, and again, this change of density can be described as a quasi-particle, which is called the dimeron. So now I will show you in this talk that this critical point strongly depends on R star. Is this a smooth transition or is a sharp transition? It's a sharp transition. It's, it's, it's exactly a, a sharp transition. I will show you the energies of the two, but... Uh, so here is the outline of my talk. I will first of all introduce uh, the Hamiltonian that I use in the two-channel model, the ansatz that I use for the two branches, polaronic and dimeronic, and then I will describe the properties of these two branches when the impurity is at rest. In particular, we will see this, the crossing point and a non-trivial weakly interacting limit that we find where we can calculate uh, this crossing point, in particular, analytically. Then, in these three uh, parts of the talk, I will concentrate only on the polaronic branch, that is the one on the left-hand side, and uh, I will calculate the quasi-particle residue and the pair correlation function, that is, I will calculate the density around uh, the impurity. And then finally, I will consider a situation in which the impurity is moving in the Fermi gas. So uh, here is the two-channel Hamiltonian. You see it's given in, a, in the Fourier space. We have a sum over all wave vectors k. We have the kinetic energy of the fermions, which is given here. So it's h bar square k squared divided by 2m. We have the kinetic energy of uh, the impurity. So here is capital M. And uh, this operator creates a fermion, and this creates an impurity with wave vector k. Then there is a part, which is this red part, which is in the closed channel. So first we have the kinetic energy of the molecule. 
uh, correctly uh, normalized to take into account uh, the correctly the masses. We have the internal energy of the molecule, which is this uh, state here. And uh, here is the operator that counts the number of molecules with wave vector k. And then we have a coupling between the open channel and the closed channel. So lambda is the strength of the coupling. V is the volume of the system. So we, we, we first we start in a box, but then we will make the volume 10 into plus in, to, to infinity. So we will take the thermodynamic limit. And you see here that I can destroy uh, an impurity with wave vector uh, k prime, destroy a fermion with wave vector k, and then create a molecule in such a way that the total momentum is conserved. Of course, I have also th the opposite process. And uh, this function is a cutoff function that uh, is necessary to well-define the Hamiltonian, but uh, we can think it to be one. So never mind for the moment. Don't, don't pay attention to it. OK, so now the link between uh, these quantities and the scattering length is given by this expression here. So here you see appearing the scattering length. Uh, and that's it. Where is the intervention? Sorry? The uh, well, finally, you take, um, um, you actually don't need the interparticle potential. You need just uh, this coupling between the open and the closed channel. Uh, what do you mean? Uh, you, you can incorporate the potential in the energy somehow. I'm not so sure. Um, maybe. It's sort of an effective model. So you have the scattering length that shows up explicitly. Okay. You have the molecular energy. And then you have the coupling lambda okay. that also is the characteristic right. of the attachment. Okay. I guess the part that I don't see is where's the R star? Well, it's hidden, it's, in, it's hidden here, actually, in lambda square. Mm -hmm. So you have a relation with, yes, the uh, lambda square is actually 1 over r star with some mm -hmm. constants. Do, do you have a formula for r star in terms of, in terms of these parameters that you can Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's say r star is, is given by, uh, so pi h bar to the power 4. And then you have the uh, reduced mass to the power 2. And then there is lambda square. So this is the relation between r star and lambda square. Actually, uh, w w w what counts is this molecular state. W well, finally, what, what, what you want is to fix the scattering length. Right, right. This is what. Uh, right, you fix the scattering length. But when you send the, the cutoff for k chi yes. to infinity, the, the, the second term on the right hand side becomes a very. Long. Diverges. It's a, like a linearly dependent on the momentum. Cutoff. Exactly, exactly. Therefore, lambda squared is of order 1 over the momentum cutoff. Lambda squared is fixed. And is the molecular state oh. that goes to infinity. Oh, so molecular energy goes to infinity. Exactly. So lambda square is fixed because R star is fixed. Okay. So is a, is a R star is a characteristic of the of, of your wide resonance. Mm -hmm. uh, not wide or narrow. Okay, so let me introduce the ansatz that we use uh, to calculate the energy. So first, the polaronic ansatz is composed of three uh, elements acting on the Fermi C. In the first part, we have, with an amplitude phi, we create an impurity with wave vector k on the Fermi C, and is sketched by this figure here. In the second part, we take one um, atom from the Fermi C, and we make uh, a molecular state. While in the third part of the ansatz, we have a particle hole pair in the Fermi C and the impurity that takes the whole momentum. So notice that this ansatz is limited to 
only one pair of particle hole excitations in the Fermi scene. So now what we do is we minimize the energy in this polonic ansatz with respect to the variational parameters, and we get that the energy of the polaron is given by the kinetic energy of the impurity plus an integral part taken over all Q that belongs to the Fermi C. And you have a function that depends on the energy of the polaron itself. So the energy appears here and here. And we solve this equation numerically to get uh, the energy of the polaronic branch. Uh, large k no actually this is misleading i mean uh, large k can take any value so yes sorry no not at all so the answer remains the same sorry uh we it's a complicated function of uh, <laughs> It's just a complicated function. What matters is that it's a function of the energy itself. So you have to, it's an implicit equation for the energy. Then how do you measure the polaron energy? It's like relative to the nominal gravity of gas? E exactly, relative to the energy of the Fermi C. Yes. Here is a bit more complicated. It's the ansatz for the, for the dimeron, but it's very similar, except that there is an extra term. So uh, with an amplitude eta, I'm creating a molecule on the Fermi C, but this time with uh, a, a particle uh, less. OK, well, it's, it's a detail. But you see, uh, the first term of the ansatz is this one. In the second one, we have the molecule that has, is dissociated. In the third one, we have a particle hole pair plus the molecule. And in the fourth, we have, again, a particle hole pair plus the molecule that is dissociated. So again, this ansatz is consistent with the previous one because it's limited to only one pair of particle hole excitations. Again, we minimize uh, the energy with respect to the variational parameters. But this time is a bit more complicated. We are not able to have uh, an implicit equation for the energy. But we have uh, this integral equation with a kernel that depends on the energy of the dimeron acting on this variational parameter, which depends on k and q. So again, we solve this equation numerically to get the energy of uh, the dimeron. So before showing you the result that we find, let me tell you that uh, the problem of one impurity in a Fermi C enters to a more uh, general problem that is the one of a discrete state which is coupled to a continuum. So you see it very well here in the ansatz. There is one discrete state that is the free impurity. And the rest of the ansatz is just a continuum because you have to sum up over all uh, k's that are outside the Fermi C. The same thing happens for the dimeron. You see that the first term is, um, is a discrete state, and the rest is a continuum. So what can we uh, know from this, uh, from this statement? Well, we know that two cases can happen. Either the discrete state is expelled uh, from the continuum, and it remains a discrete state. Or the second situation that can happen is that the discrete state gets diluted into the continuum which means that uh, the energy of this discrete state becomes complex with an imaginary part and a real part. So this situation is of physical interest if the imaginary part is much smaller than the real part, because to the imaginary part uh, is associated a decay rate. So if the imaginary part is very small compared to the real part, it means that uh, is a, its lifetime is very long. Yes. Yes. 
So if you have, uh, let's say, you have a continuum. Well, this is not really a continuum what I'm drawing, but it's a quasi-continuum. And I have the energy of a state which is here, inside the, this quasi-continuum. So you, you have to couple the discrete state to the continuum. So what, what's his energy? So let's, let's say you have the ground state of an atom, the excited state of an atom, mm -hmm. coupled to light. Okay, So the energy of the ground state is in the continuum. So what happens to this energy? It's expelled from the continuum. It, it, it will be a little bit below, so it remains a discrete state. Nothing happens to the ground state. On the contrary, to the excited state, when it's coupled to the, to the continuum, it gets an imaginary part, which means that the excited state has some, some lifetime. Sorry, if is there ever a case where it's anything but the ground state is not expelled? I mean, is, are, could somebody give a physical example of a expelled state that's not a ground state? Well, thanks. <laughs> okay, let's analyze the properties of the two branches when uh, the impurity is at rest. So here I summarize all what we find about uh, the polaronic and the dimeronic branch. So here I plot uh, the strength of the interaction, 1 over kFa, as a function of kFr star. And I do this for uh, three different mass ratios. So in, this, in, in these two plots here, the impurity has the same mass as the fermions. In this plot here, uh, the mass ratio is 6.6439. That is an impurity of potassium-40 in a Fermi C of lithium-6, which is an experimental uh, situation that has been realized uh, in Innsbruck, for example. And here, to be complete, I do the opposite. So an impurity of lithium-6 in a Fermi C of potassium-40. On the left-hand side, we have the polaronic branch. So we find. A, a, this uh, black line below which uh, the polaron is the ground state. And above this line, the polaron is not anymore the ground state. And we find two regions, one where the effective mass of the polaron is positive, and one where the effective mass of the polaron is negative, which indicates an instability of this branch. On the right hand side, we find exactly the same line uh, as as in here, on top of which the dimeron is the ground state, which is, you see, is complementary to this region. And uh, below this line, there are three regions. Uh, again, one where uh, the effective mass of the dimeron is positive, one where the effective mass of the dimeron is negative, indicating, again, an instability of this branch, and one where uh, the dimeron develops an imaginary part. So now I will concentrate only on uh, this black line, which is the crossing between the polaron and the dimeron. And this is what I plot. So here I have the energy uh, with respect to the, the energy of the Fermi C as a function of 1 over kFa for the three mass ratios that I've uh, shown you. And I consider three different situations in which uh, here we have a wide resonance, so r star is equal to 0. Here, the resonance starts to become narrow, so R star is, KFR star is equal to 1. And here, the resonance is very, very narrow, so KFR star is equal to 10. Let's have a look at this uh, graph here. You see the black line is the energy of the polaron, and the red line is the energy of the dimeron. And you see that they perfectly cross each other, so it's, it's a perfect crossing between the two. And in this case, the crossing is at 0 0.36. There are Monte Carlo data available to check only when uh, you have equal masses and for a wide resonance. And you see that the error bars uh, of the Monte Carlo results lay perfectly within the, uh, so, well, the, the energy of the ansatz lay perfectly in within uh, the error bars.
Uh, I actually uh, don't know too much. I know that is uh, um, uh, diagrammatic Monte Carlo. Okay, so they just include some diagrams. I think they went up to order nine or ten, something like this. Okay. But uh, so f f my message here is that uh, at least for this graph, the uh, what come out from the from the ansatz, so the energy is perfectly captured by, by the ansatz. So notice here that uh, when the resonance is wide, the crossing point is at 0 0.84. Then the resonance becomes narrow, and the crossing point moves to the left. And when it's very narrow, it moves even f uh, further to the left-hand side, and it becomes negative. So let me summarize what I've said here. So I plot the crossing point as a function of kfr star. And you see that for all these masses, the crossing moves towards negative values of, this, of the scattering length, which is quite uh, interesting because um, it means that uh, when r star becomes larger, the system prefers to make uh, a dimeron phase. So it leaves more space for the dimeron, because for each of these curves, on the bottom, the ground state is polaronic, and on the top, the ground state is dimeronic. Why this is interesting? Because, uh, well, if you think that in vacuum, for any R star, you can have a two-body bound state only if the scattering length is positive, you may think that when you add the Fermi C, this blocks somehow um, the, the molecule, and it makes it more difficult to make a molecule. But this is not what we find, actually. So to understand this, let's ask ourselves the question, when do we have a two-body bound state in the ground state? First of all, in vacuum, because we know the answer. So in this two-channel model, we may think that when this molecular state is below 0, then the system can sustain a two-body bound state as the ground state. But this is actually a naive answer, because uh, the energy of this state didn't take into account a second order process in which the molecule can dissociate and re-sociate again. And this process will lower a little bit the energy. And this process is, has a name, it's called the lamp shift due to vacuum fluctuation in the open channel. So if we recalculate the, mo the energy of the molecular state in this way, we get the original molecular energy minus an integral contribution where you see appearing uh, lambda square, indicating that is a second order process, divided by the energy of the, of the free particles um, when they have dissociated. So taking into account the previous relations, we find that this new molecular energy is given by minus lambda square divided by A with some constants. So this, everything is positive. So uh, when um, we ask that this molecule, this energy of the molecular state has to be negative, we get the correct answer that A has to be positive. Uh, it's not clear we have to plot any structure uh, full bound state. Uh, uh, we, for example, have one bound state and they go to a continuum mm -hmm. that uh, the energy will be reduced by that. Because it depends on the size, the phase of the It depends where you start because if you start in the ground state, if you if you if you start from the ground state of the system, uh -huh. uh, you have a second order process. This can only lower the energy. Does the uh, phase of the continuum vary? In the I mean, that's accounted for by the scattering length. Yeah, I think I think the ground state is very sensitive, right? So when you have a second order process, it's yes. So you, you, can, you can think about a process in which, uh, let's say you have an atom. You have the ground state and the excited state. And uh, you, you have a second order process to, to, to couple. And you, you, you're saying that this energy can go up. Yes. Uh, there are some reactions which basically consider an integral phase. Mm -hmm. For example, fusion reactions. 
Well, actually, f but for atoms, I've never seen such a process. I mean, okay. for uh, I, I, at least I don't know. Relating uh, yes, maybe it's just that you are treating the thing as a social law energy that you have everything in this gas units and then somehow that's all just a product of lambda squared and a I think may account for the phases that you're talking about, right? But so I, I didn't know about this, th this possibility actually. Yes, for the inter internal energy of the molecule, yes. Okay. The two body bound state energy, right? Uh, sorry, the two body bound? Is this the energy of the two body bound state? Uh, in the closed channel. In total? In the closed channel. It's, so it's the coupled, it's the energy that you, it's the eigenvalue that you get when you solve the coupled equation. The Bose equation. This. Tilda, yeah, 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 yeah. Question here. So, uh, I think that if you use this formula for the scattering uh, amplitude to find the energy, mm -hmm. then you find the pole, mm -hmm. uh, you would get a more complicated function for energy in terms of uh, A and R star. Mm -hmm. That involves some square root or something. Well, it's 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 very simple. You you make an analytical continuation, so yeah, you take k is, is equal to i q, yeah. for example, and then you get the no, exactly you want a pole of yeah. this. Yeah, you, you, you said you find the root of the of the denominator, and you find that the formula for kappa for q involves the square root or something. But uh, that that yes. formula is just a rational function of a and. It doesn't matter. W what counts finally yeah. is, uh, y y is your answer. When can you have a two-body bound state here? Uh -huh. Only when A is positive. Right, but, uh, yeah, this is my answer. And, and this is the same answer. Yeah, that I agree with. But I, I, uh, kind of, uh, I don't understand the formula for the energy of the two-body bound state in terms of A and R star. Uh, actually, I don't know very well what is the, the relation, but y you see that the model here is different. Here you don't have two channels. Here you do have two channels. Um, but uh, even for two channels, you still have a formula for the scattering uh, amplitude. And you can still use this formula for the scattering amplitude to determine the bound state energy. Even if you have intermediate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. The two atoms, they can intermediate stay in the molecular state and make it circular. But you can still use that formula to find energy on the bound state. Uh, yes. And you're saying that uh, yeah. this formula is different?
A, the role of the drug court, and then go into the lens for whether it's in the near or the lower or even lens court, whether it's one or what agent is there as well. But if A is uh, very large, larger than R star, you still, you, you will still recover the one over A square in the I think, uh, maybe. Uh, we can maybe put exactly. that um, it seems like it's fairly simple math to go through and just work out what the bounds are. Because what, what, what's important to me is that uh, you can have a two body bound state only when A is positive here for, for any R star. And this is exactly the same answer that we find here. So now I can add the effect of the Fermi C. What's happening? So you have two effects. One is on the Lamb shift that limits this integral to all k that are larger than kf. And the second effect is the change of the dissociation threshold, which is uh, not zero, but is the Fermi uh, energy. So if we uh, recalculate the molecular energy in this way, and we ask it to be uh, less than uh, the Fermi energy, we get this condition, 1 over kfa, larger than a constant, 2 over pi, which comes from this limiting here, minus capital M divided by M plus capital M, Kf r star. So you see that uh, there is a minus sign and Kf r star. So you see that where we have a two body bound state is uh, pushed towards negative values. And this is what, um, so I, I, I compare this simple uh, reasoning result with the, the analytical, uh, well, the numerical results. And you see that these curves, which are the dashed lines coming from this equation here, they all start at 2 over pi. But you see that the slope is quite well captured by this simple reasoning. So now, to get better this point, one needs to do uh, a better calculation. And uh, you will see that. Uh, this better calculation completely agrees with uh, the numerics. But let me show you how we do it. So we introduced a non-trivial weakly interacting limit. But first, let me introduce the standard weakly interacting limit, in which we make A tending to 0 minus, and R star is fixed. So in this way, you see very well that uh, uh, if this term diverges, uh, the the other two terms are negligible compared to this one, and in particular R star. So we lose information about the narrowness of the resonance. So what we want to do is we want to take the limit A going to 0 minus and 1 over A uh, comparable to R star, so proportional. So in other words, we take this limit when the product is constant. So R star tends to infinity. So we calculate to first order the energy of the polaron, to first order the energy of the dimeron, we compare them, and we get uh, a condition on 1 over kfa that is given by minus r divided by 1 plus r, which is just, uh, so r is the mass ratio. r is given by uh, capital M divided by small m. So it's the same uh, slope that we found before. But now you see that we don't have any more 2 over pi, but uh, there is a multiplication of a complex function that depends on uh, r, the mass ratio. And you see, if we compare now this result with the numerics, you see that the dashed line, in particular for these two uh, mass ratio, are practically indistinguishable from uh, the full lines. So, uh, well, this. Uh, dot is corresponds to the um, uh, experimental results obtained in Innsbruck, and you see that is quite uh, in agreement with our calculation. And another thing to, to notice is that the analytics uh, differs from the numerics in this region, where is not supposed to work. It differs only by a three percent. So I, th I think we were very lucky because there, there are lines. But uh, anyway, so this, uh, this expression here seems to work very well also uh, for r star equal to 0. So let me now concentrate only on uh, the polaronic branch. 
and I introduce uh, the quasi-particle residue, which is called uh, traditionally Z, and this physically quantifies the quasi-particle nature of the ground state of the system. It's defined as the modulus square of the first component of the ansatz, so this one, and its meaning is very clear in two uh, situations. So when Z is equal to 1, only this part is present in the ansatz, so we have just a free impurity. So when z instead is equal to 0, this contribution in the ansatz is absent, so we only have a continuum. So we say that there is no quasi-particle. So in between these two values, one has to calculate z uh, numerically. But before calculating it, let me uh, give you a test, uh, which is a, a Monte Carlo test, which is available for equal masses and r star equal to 0. You see that already the energy of the polaron was uh, within the error bars of Monte Carlo. But you see also here, I plot z as a function of 1 over kfa. So uh, the result of the ansatz is this black line. And the result of Monte Carlo are these uh, blue dots. So you see that uh, the ansatz captures very well not only the energy, but also the state. So here is what we find for, uh, for Z. Again, same mass ratios and same um, flash, um, flashback lengths. In general, we find, so th the numerics is this uh, black line. So in general, we find that uh, far on the right hand side, Z is equal to 0. So when we approach the polar on to dimeron crossing point, Z starts to open. And in the left hand side, where the polaron is the ground state, z gets close to 1. And here is uh, uh, an analytic result, which is valid uh, far on the left hand side. One thing to notice here is that you see these uh, dots come from uh, experimental results of Innsbruck. And you see that uh, the experimental points are very well in agreement with uh, the numerics of the ansatz. Here, maybe uh, I can skip this. Yes? Yes, uh, this going up, um, well, exactly. So the analytical result is valid far on the left hand side. So here um, it's not, yeah, it's not really valid. Okay, let me now uh, talk about the pair correlation function. So I've been telling you that uh, if you put an impurity in a Fermi gas, the density around the impurity changes. And so we want to measure uh, how this density changes. So the way to do it is to calculate the pair correlation function, which is uh, a symmetric function of um, the distance between the impurity and the fermion due to the symmetry of the, of the interaction. So this function depends only on the distance between the up particle, which is a fermion, and the down particle, which is the impurity, and is defined as the expectation value of uh, fermionic field operators, which are in blue, and uh, impurity field operators, uh, red, and I divide it by uh, the uncorrelated value. So that is the density of the fermions times the density of the impurity. So uh, I will show you that this function has a spatial is, a spatial is a measure of the spatial extension of the polaron. And uh, it presents Friedel oscillations and a multiscale structure. So the first point is uh, the spatial extension of the polaron. So here I plot this function, g of x minus 1, which is the uncorrelated value. And I multiply by kfx to the power 2. I, I will tell you why I multiply by kfx to the power 2. And I plot it as a function of kfx. So here the impurity is supposed to be at 0. And I'm looking at some distance x. What is the density of fermions? Okay. So you see that there is a lot of density around the impurity. And then some oscillations start to appear. And this oscillation, finally, they die out at large distance. Indeed, so at large distance, we get um, uh, an analytic 
expression. So at large distance, we find that this function behaves as uh, minus two, a coefficient a4, a coefficient b4, and then you see a cosinus of 2 kfx. So these are uh, the so-called Friedel oscillation that you see them here at large distance. But you see also that there is a, a 1 over x to the power 4. So this function dies out as 1 over x to the power 4. So what is the consequence of this uh, 1 over x to the power 4? Well, the consequence is that if I want to calculate the size of the polaron, so I'm calculating the, the average uh, radius of the polaron, so I have to integrate in all x. I got x times g of x minus 1. This is just the definition of uh, the radius of, of, of the polaron. I can look at large distance, and I can use this expression that we find. So the cosinus term, it, it, it will be fine because it oscillates, so it doesn't uh, give any problems. But this constant term, uh, you see very well that it diverges. So because I have an x coming from here, and x2 coming from the, the Jacobian. So in total, I have x to the power 3. I do this integral in, in spherical coordinates. And then I have uh, 1 over x to the power 4. So this object uh, diverges log logarithmically, essentially. So the message is that the size of the polaron is, uh, well, it, it diverges uh, logarithmically. So Sorry? Is it negative, uh, size is negative. Size is negative. Yes. Uh, actually, something strange. Yeah, but you don't have to. Uh, well, actually, uh, y you cannot use this expression at zero. Why? Why? So it's divergent only at the larger edge. Yeah, the exactly, edge. exactly. So uh, what what I mean by this is not well. This is not this uh, the final result of the size, but uh, it tells you that it diverges. That's it, because you can use this expression only at, uh, at, at infinity. What's the, or sorry, separate question. What's the x in front of the g of x minus 1? Where does that come from? From here. Oh, oh right, of course. Because by definition, I'm, I'm, I'm calculating yeah. the, <laughs> yes. I have a, another question. If you, when you put this integral over x, if you integrate not over x times g x minus 1, but uh, integral, integrate over g x minus 1. Without that extra factor x, mm -hmm. I wonder if you get something related to the energy of the thing. You get zero. Uh, the minus sign uh, may have something uh, written in math, but it's uh, g, g minus 1. That minus sign that you put in front doesn't have any meaning. It's just an oscillation sign. OK? Just an oscillation sign. For, for, the, for this, you mean? Uh, yes, well, g, g of x is it's an oscillating function. Yeah, so the minus sign uh, is, does not even matter. Because it, it has plus and minus anyway. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's infinity, right? Yes, yes, yeah. And yeah. then the physical meaning of the average of x has to be a positive factor. Right? It's an average of x. It's a radius, so. It's a radius. Yeah, it's cheating, but it works, yes. Because you're talking about the distance, right? X is mm -hmm. by definition a positive number. Uh, so I'm wondering if this event is that much of a change. Uh, I think you can move on. Yeah. Right. Okay. 
Well, so now you understand why I put uh, kfx to the power 2, because it's actually what, what enters in the integration here, if I do it in, uh, in spherical coordinates. So I just have to integrate this object. So here I plot the coefficients a4 and b4. So uh, these coefficients here. So remember that a4 is the, is the bad guy. So um, for different mass ratios and again for different flashback lengths. And what I want to show you here is that a4 for all these situations is finite on, on the left hand side, which means that for all this situation, the polaron is a spatially extended object. Just another uh, uh, slide to show you now that uh, I've multiplied here kfx to the power 4 instead of 2. And you see that these oscillations, um, well, th the function g of x minus 1 behaves like this. And uh, inst we find three different regions. So one region is the region where this function decays as 1 over x4 that I have discussed uh, earlier. One region close to 1, we find a uh, log x divided by x4. And we find also an intermediate region where there are cosinus integral and sinus integral. So the spatial structure of the polaron is, uh, has uh, three uh, scales. So the one that we have seen earlier was this one. So let me move to the last uh, um, part of the talk where uh, I would like to um, uh, consider the case in which the impurity is now moving with some wave vector capital K. And again, the situation is exactly as before, so there is no interaction between the fermions. And between the impurity and the fermion, we have an attraction, small one, so we can use uh, perturbation theory. And R star is for, now f is for us uh, fixed now. So what do we know when R star is tending to zero? We know that when the impurity is at rest, the ground state is the Fermi polaron. So we have calculated it. And uh, the way, um, so there are many ways to calculate this ground state. But one way, for example, is to use the ansatz that uh, was introduced by Chevy and that we have used uh, in the previous part of the talk. But another way is to use perturbative, um, perturbation theory, which was used uh, by Bishop first in the 70s to calculate um, exactly the ground state uh, of um, an impurity at rest. But so what do we know now when the impurity is moving? So we don't know much, but we know that the energy of the polaron becomes complex. So it, de it develops an imaginary part that was calculated by Bishop in this paper uh, for the specific case in which you have equal masses. And he found that uh, for all capital Ks lower than Kf, there is a K4 power law in the imaginary part. So now what we want to do, we want to calculate uh, also the real part, but also the imaginary part for all uh, mass ratios and for all R stars. But unfortunately, we cannot use the ansatz because the ansatz does not reproduce this result. So it's unreliable uh, when the polaron is moving. So what we do is to use perturbation theory. And we get the energy of the polaron as uh, the kinetic energy of the impurity. Plus, we get a mean field term. So rho is the density of the fermions. And the second order term is rho g to the power 2 divided by the Fermi energy you see that there is this function that appears of uh, k divided by kf. And this function is an integral in six variables over uh, the momentum of the particle hole pairs that the impurity creates by moving. We can solve it exactly analytically. And uh, I will show you that this function presents uh, singularities of the nth order derivative in these points, kappa equal to 0, kappa equal to 1, and kappa equal to r, where r is the mass ratio. So kappa is, for us, uh, k divided by kf. Well, g is the effective coupling constant, is equal to uh, 2 pi 
h bar square a divided by um, the um, uh, uh, effect one the yes a is negative and small for us yes because uh, yes it's uh, on the polaronic branch that we want to Oracle. And what is the meaning of these uh, singularities of the nth order derivative? Well, I can show you that uh, you can relate the nth order derivative of this function to some observables. So, uh, in other words, these observables will present um, some uh, strange singularities. So, this is the result that we find for the real part of this function. So you see, it's a function of the mass ratio, r. And what I'd like you to notice is that you see that here there is a kappa minus 1 to the power 3 that multiplies a log of kappa minus 1 in the modulus. So if I derive three times this object, I get rid of the first component, and I'm left with a log of kappa minus 1, which diverges at uh, kappa equal to 1. The same thing happens here. I have kappa minus r multiplying kappa minus r, log of kappa minus r. So if I derive four times, I get uh, a logarithmic divergence at kappa equal to r. So here I plot the real part of this function f as a function of kappa for uh, the usual mass ratios. And for the moment, r star is equal to 0. So you see that in general, when kappa is equal to 0, we have a maximum of this function. And then as soon as the polaron starts to move, then this function uh, uh, diminishes. And eventually, it reaches 0, which is the asymptotic value captured by this dashed line. The same thing happens for these mass ratios. And here I plot the second derivative of this function. And you see that for the specific case when the mass ratios are, are uh, equal to 1, you see that there is a logarithmic divergence at kappa equal to 1. So now, the second order derivative is related to the effective mass of the polaron. So it's a, it, it's a, gener a generalized effective mass. So it means that at kappa equal to 1, the effective mass of the polaron will, uh, will diverge. But is it, well, is a, this divergence is actually an artifact of the perturbative approach because uh, exactly at kappa equal to 1, so at, at uh, k equal to kf, uh, well, this shows that perturbation theory is not valid anymore. So one has to use a non-perturbative approach to calculate this uh, second derivative. But still, uh, just a little bit um, away from this point, we expect uh, to find a, diver a divergent effective mass of the polaron. What happens to the imaginary part? Here I plot minus the imaginary part of this function f. You see that at kappa equal to 0, the imaginary part is exactly 0. Then we find a k4 uh, power law that Bishop also found. And then, uh, at large values, finally, uh, it reaches the asymptotic uh, value captured by this dashed line. So this asymptotic is just linear. OK, instead, here I plot the second, der the second order derivative. Instead of having a logarithmic divergence, you see that it has a jump. And this jump disappears uh, for these uh, mass ratios. So. Uh, what about experiments? Can we see this effect that we have predicted, for, like for example, for the effective mass? Well, experiments are usually done at r star, which is different than 0. And so to count for this r star, you have to substitute the function f with the function f tilde, which is equal to f minus a contribution coming from r star. And so c1 and c2 are uh, just co two coefficients. So experimentally, one can measure exactly the real part and the imaginary part of this function f using radio frequency spectroscopy. 
And just to put some numbers, here I've taken uh, uh, the mixture potassium-14 lithium-6, which have uh, this mass ratio. And the experimental situation in Innsbruck is at KFR star equal to 1. And I have selected uh, a reasonable value of KFA, which is reachable by experiment, but is small. So what do we see? In the real part of the function f tilde now, we see that the dashed line, which is this result here, lays outside the uh, uncertainty uh, that they have in the experiment. So it's measurable. We have also calculated the effect of a small and finite temperature. And you see is this uh, dotted line. And you see that it's, a, it's, well, it's just a few percent. So the message is that uh, this function f tilde should be uh, measurable by, by these experiments. The same thing happens for the imaginary part, but it's a little bit more um, strong. The, um, it's not a few percent, it's like a 10% maybe. But anyway, so we would like to see the effect of the, of the real part and of the, derivat the second derivative of this real part. So with this, I have concluded. So I have shown you, uh, uh, we have considered the problem of a single impurity in uh, a Fermi C in the presence of two lengths, so the, the S-wave uh, scattering length and the flashback length. We have calculated the ground state of this system with uh, numerics and analytic uh, results that we have that compare very well with uh, experiments. We have a physical interpretation for this shift of the, of the crossing towards negative values of the scattering length in terms of the lamp shift. And concentrating only on the polaronic ansatz, we have calculated uh, Z, which has a uh, very good agreement with experiments, and uh, the pair correlation function, which is uh, a measure of the size of the polaron. And finally, I have uh, told you about uh, our recent results about uh, the moving polaron that uh, should be observable in current experiments, both the real and the imaginary part of this function f. So thank you very much for your attention. I <laughs> please. Actually, uh, this doesn't work because um, okay, you have um, let's say you have uh, one over KFA, and this you have this is the energy of the polaron. But in the ansatz, you have seen that uh, it, there is a discrete state and uh, a continuum of particle-hole pairs. So the continuum actually starts here. And uh, the point is that from here, when, you start to when the impurity starts to move, before reaching the continuum, there is a gap which is unphysical. And th this gap is, uh, is due to the fact that we have cut the Hilbert space at one particle hole pairs. If, if you would go to an infinite number of particle hole pairs, this, this gap will not exist anymore and, uh, and will be just, just, just above the energy of the polaron. So this is the reason. Actually, I don't know. I think, uh, I think it's still an open question. What, what people have done is to go beyond the one particle whole pair approximation. So they have gone to two particle whole pairs, and they have seen that the difference is minimal. So they, they have said that, uh, OK, you expect that if you go from two to three, the difference will be even smaller. But you, c you cannot say, I mean, if you have a, a Taylor expansion, you want that your first term 
uh, to be larger than the second, to be larger than the third, etc. But it cannot be true. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, the error in the energy, you mean? Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, I can look up for it, but... So I think it's still an open question. <laughs>